Hello and welcome everybody to this new video. Hello and welcome Glenn. How are you? Ah, all well, thanks. Yourself? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, you're on vacation or you're already back in business? Well, here the holidays have just come to an end, so uh, yeah, <laughs> back, back to work. Okay, right. Today we want to talk about the Arctic areas and the high north. Especially here for us in Norway it is an important or interesting question. All countries with territory in the Arctic are connected in the Arctic Council where they discuss different questions around the Arctic. Um, our neighbor country Russia is a country with the largest territory in the Arctic. Um, so it is of course important what kind of relationship we have to our direct neighbor. Russia and Norway has a direct border and of course we have a cooperation in the Arctic. Um, the relationship between our two countries uh, during the Cold War time was always uh, good or neutral. We managed in Norway to stand between the Soviet Union on one side and our NATO allies on the other side. But the question is, how is the relation now and what has changed in this relationship? Maybe we, we can start with that. Well, the, uh, looking at the Arctic is quite important to predict uh, or make uh, well, assumptions about how uh, the relationship between uh, Norway and Russia will develop because of the Norway's geographical position. It's uh, in the high north of Europe. so. Uh, uh, so within the Western Alliance or NATO, uh, Norway will be will always be a key uh, key actor in terms of an entry point into the Arctic. So uh, when the Arctic is peaceful and cooperative, uh, there's a better uh, opportunity for cooperation and peaceful relations. However, if the Arctic becomes uh, an area of uh, a geopolitical rivalry, as it is in the process of becoming, then it's reasonable to expect that Norway would very easily become an American frontline against Russia and uh, your relations would uh, take a turn to the worst quite uh, quickly. So uh, the Arctic yeah, is a very central uh, aspect to understand the relationship between Norway and Russia. But Norway has always been a NATO country since uh, 1949. Um, and we managed to balance between the Soviet Union and our allies, the US and the other NATO countries. Was this a problem in cooperation between Norway and Russia in the Arctic or did they find a way to cooperate when it comes to the high north? Uh, well, Norway uh, initially had a difficult balancing act because uh, after the Second World War, uh, NATO was formed uh, with the purpose of containing the Soviet Union and uh, Norway became a member. So Sweden and Finland did not join, but Norway has, a, as mentioned before, a very important geographical position, position due to its long coastline uh, to the Arctic, which links North America to Europe. Uh, and in this high north, this is this, yeah, I guess, the attraction to um, well, the strategic importance of Norway. So. It might be considered strange that Norway would join NATO as uh, during the Second World War there was the Germans who invaded Norway uh, and it was actually the Red Army that liberated the Norwegian ter territories in the high north. Uh, that being said, uh, today it's very common for pundits in Norway to argue that the Red Army did not liberate Europe, they only replaced the German occupiers. However, in Norway this was simply not the case. That is, the Russians came in, liberated the northern parts of the country and then they went home. So it doesn't fit well within the NATO narrative, but but nonetheless, this was kind of our uh, the relationship, and, and and based on this, um, Norway attempted to develop a balancing position. On one hand, it argued that it would be a good ally to NATO and the Americans, but it would also be a good neighbor to the Russians. So uh, so again, uh, seeking this NATO uh, uh, a NATO partnership however, without provoking the Russians. And this balancing act initially seemed to work. That is, it always set some conditions. It was committed to NATO, but you know, no stationing of foreign troops based on Norwegian soil. Uh, obviously, that's the most important aspect. 
uh, no provocations against the Russians in the high north. So a limit activity there. And uh, I say it's largely it was largely successful because cooperation in the Barents Sea and the Arctic appears to be uh, well to some well was to some extent immune from this very fierce geopolitical rivalry of the Cold War. So for a while it it, it did work, but uh, this has gradually uh, been begun to collapse for yeah, a variety of reasons, which, which we can discuss. Mm. Norway has, as you say, always had this strategy not to have uh, US soldiers or foreign soldiers on Norwegian soil. Uh, now Norway or <laughs> the government of Norway has decided to change this policy. Now we have uh, uh, US troops stationed in Norway. Uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear submarines coming to our harbors in the city of Bergen and in Tromsø. We have a radar station in the high north. So we have changed this policy completely. Um, that is of course obviously for Russia too. Why we have changed this policy? Because it was very good and positive how it was before. Why we have changed it? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because uh, this this balance uh, Norway had between a good ally and a good neighbor has now, I would argue, been largely abandoned. That is, uh, uh, Norway has put its full weight behind the U.S. and NATO, and the relationship with Russia is therefore going uh, from bad to worse. Uh, at least, is a big part of the reason uh, because uh, Norway no longer attempts to be a good neighbor with Russia to the extent it uh, it has to reduce uh, commitments to the U.S. and NATO. Now, it's a good question, how did we get to this point? Obviously, the Arctic has lately played a key role. However, there's been many other reasons why. Uh, for, for one, and this is a bit of a paradox, is when the Cold War came to an end, we began to build down our, our military defenses. And thus, we became increasingly dependent on the United States. And uh, once you become too militarily dependent on a foreign power, obviously, the implication is that you then begin to outsource your foreign policy as well. So this excessive dependence on the U.S. actually was one of the paradoxes of the end of the Cold War. Now, there's been very little democratic debate in Norway about, for example, everything from sanctions policy to this new military adventurism after the Cold War. Uh, and effectively, Norway tends to go on autopilot often when, when Norway decides to go to war. Uh, so that's one reason. But we also have some ideological reasons. So this argument that NATO was a force for good after the Cold War, simply spreading democracy. And uh, so NATO expansionism and military interventionism was simply a common good, and it should not be feared by Russia. Indeed, uh, many people actually believe this, uh, which might seem absurd, but, but this was the, the leading ideology. And also you had uh, the Norwegian political class also uh, to some extent, getting a little bit obsessed about this idea of punching above its weight. So we're a small country of five million people, yet we stand on the front line as soon as you know there's any humanitarian intervention around the world, or you know s stepping up as the a leading NATO member. This was uh, also uh, an obsession by the political class, and um, also I would add the increased value of Norwegian territory. Not to go on on that tangent here, but. Uh, for example, after the Cold War, uh, there was growing uh, pressure or push from the United States to develop missile defense, in which uh, Norwegian territory is very important because radars on their territory give huge footprint into Russian territory. And also the northern seas are important for ship-based uh, interceptive missiles if you're going to uh, intercept Russian missiles going north, uh, that is across the Arctic. So again, I don't want to go too far into it, but this, uh, this was initially at least uh, through the 2000s, a key reason why Norway also was uh, well began to change uh, its, its uh, relationship with, uh, with Russia. Because uh, uh, when the Cold War came to an end, or, the, or at least when the Soviet Union collapsed, the US wanted to revive missile defense plans to undermine Russia's retaliatory capabilities. So what this launches a first strike on Russia, then a strategic missile defense shield uh, is in, is in, uh, well, has a purpose of intercepting any retaliatory strikes from Russia that would survive in this first strike. So uh, effectively, it's uh, giving nuclear weapons uh, an offensive, enhancing its offensive capabilities. Now, it's worth noting that one month after the collapse of the Soviet Union in January 92, that's when Bush Sr. made the State of the Union argument, 
where he said, now U.S. is the leader of the world, and he called for developing missile defense. Then a month later, in February 92, you had the, the so-called Wolfowitz Doctrine being leaked in the strategic uh, well, defense paper of the United States, arguing that the U.S. should ensure no rivals will ever challenge it again. And in, the, in this document, it listed missile defense as uh, a, a, key, uh, a, a key weapon. Uh, and very specifically because it was named that Russia was the only country that could destroy the U.S. So, so very much it was very clearly aimed against Russia. And again, also in the 1990s, you had these major European capitals warning that this would actually cancel the nuclear balance uh, with missile defense. Uh, however, once missile defense became a NATO asset, we saw that the, uh, the opposition to it began to, to recede. And... Um, you know, never, never mind the amount of evidence. If you today argue that missile defense is aimed against Russia, you're accused of peddling Russian propaganda. And uh, and there's also a lot of evidence in the WikiLeaks cables of how the U.S. embassy in Norway worked towards making the Norwegian political class and media change their critical critical rhetoric about missile defense. So so all of this was uh, well effectively both from uh, from Norway's own position, but also the increased value for the Americans. Uh, increasingly made uh, Norway more and more uh, important within within NATO. So uh, today I would say this has only increased now with the growing relevance of the Arctic, but today this former balance between being a good neighbor and a, and a good ally has been completely abandoned. And as you mentioned, uh, this uh, traditional base politics of Norway as well, uh, not having no foreign bases on our country has no, now also recently well, de facto being abandoned by accepting U.S. bases on Norwegian soil. Mm. Let us take one more look to Norway and especially to the population in Norway. For me, it looks like that the citizens of Norway are very divided in two. Um, in the south, in the capital, we have the government and they are, of course, uh, strong supporters of NATO and uh, they like this transatlantic cooperation. Uh, in the north, we have the direct border with Russia and people are much more connected to uh, Russia and related to Russia through uh, sports club, cultural clubs to uh, trade and work. Um, so for me, it looks like Norway is a little bit divided. What do you think people mostly think about this changed policy with uh, foreign troops on Norwegian ground? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, it is important to point out that uh, uh, whenever we speak about countries uh, as unitary actors, it's worth noting that within the countries there's obviously differences. Now, in the north you have uh, uh, more uh, friendly attitudes towards Russia now for many reasons. One, obviously, in Finnmark, you know, being liberated by the Red Army uh, during the Second World War, that, that obviously helps. Uh, but also because uh, it's in the north where there's more human contact, there's shared borders, and um, whenever you have more human contact, uh, this, you know, demonized version of the adversary uh, tends to fade away a bit, and uh, uh, you know more commercial ties as well so there's uh, there's a lot of uh, reasons why in the north they would uh, not share this uh, i would say russophobia which uh, which tends to run a bit rampant down south uh, where the capital is located so uh, we often see that uh, yeah in the south the nato narrative tends to 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 dominate so uh, as i mentioned before this idea that you know Russia doesn't, in the Second World War, doesn't didn't liberate anyone, it just uh, reoccupied, it never liberates anyone, just, uh, you know, conquers territory. And, you know, this is what is often peddled in the South, or believed in the South, because this is where the NATO narrative dominates. But in the North, obviously, it's very hard to convince them uh, of this, as this was not the Norwegian experience. We, you know, we were not Poland. Uh, so um, there are definitely differences, uh, yeah, across the country. Um, you already talked about the... Um U.S. Army strategy and the U.S. Army interest in Norway as a territory. Um, and we can imagine that uh, the troops will only increase in, in the next years. Is there also an economic interest in the Arctic areas or is it only military interest there? Well, it's uh, quickly becoming more, more militarized. No, no, more, more in economic interests. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, just uh, like to add what you said with this growing uh, uh, interest in, in Norway, because this I would point that this has been very gradual over the time, or over time, because uh, initially you had you know upgrading of uh, this radar in up in Bardo, which is important to get this footprint in Russian territory. Then we saw more more NATO exercises in the north, closer to Russian borders. Uh, then we had U.S. military access, uh, well, temporary to this strategic island of Jan Mayen, which is important to intercept uh, Russian ships and submarines. And uh, only, was it last year, we had, uh, uh, early this year, you had the, uh, the accommodation of U.S. warships sailing through the Barents Sea up in mm -hmm. the north for the first time since the 80s. Uh, so, and before that, we began hosting U.S. troops on a rot uh, rotating basis. This has ended now, though, or they were asked to withdraw. And then recently, we had this case now where Norway fully abandoned its military base policy. So by granting the U.S. several military bases on Norwegian soil without the ability to inspect them. So, so, so we, we, we gradually see that this has been this uh, yeah, drip, drip uh, process. Um, uh, and what was, yes, you asked the, the economics of it. Yes, what I mean is there an um, interest, an economic interest of the U.S. also in the Arctic areas? Yes, well, definitely, because yeah, what we discussed so far was the the military interests from the early '90s through the 2000s. But um, there has been big changes in the Arctic. Uh, most importantly, the ice is melting and thus retreating from the northern coastlines. Uh, this is very important because it makes the Arctic much more accessible uh, but once it becomes accessible uh, it also has uh, economic gains to be made there and as these economic gains become obvious there's more uh, attraction if not for geopolitical conflict then at least then for geoeconomic conflict so obviously russia is the largest arctic power and it has two major interests in the arctic number one would be uh, energy extraction as the arctic is full of uh, energy resources and this could further elevate Russia's position as an energy superpower, something the U.S. is not happy about. And uh, the second would be that as the Arctic uh, is melting and becoming more accessible, Russia wants to develop a transportation corridor between East Asia and Europe. So this has been called the Northern Sea Route by the Russians, and it offers a much faster and cheaper mode of transport between Asia and, and uh, Europe. So... Uh, obviously, Russia seeks investments and partners in this project because they need to develop all this supporting infrastructure. However, as we know, the West is stuck in this sanctions war against Russia, which it can't withdraw from. So Russia, therefore, looks towards China. And, uh, and uh, the Arctic is therefore becoming a central part of this so-called Greater Eurasian Partnership between the Chinese and the Russians. And as we saw in 2008, 18, sorry, 2018, China released its first white paper on the Arctic, where it referred to this Russia's northern uh, sea route or the Arctic corridor as the polar Silk Road. Now, this very clearly conceptualized the Arctic within this trillion dollar Belt and Road Initiative, which the Chinese have to integrate the entire Eurasian space. And uh, so, so not only is there huge economic gains to be made in terms of energy resources and transportation, uh, but it's also within the format of Chinese-Russian cooperation. And it's also will be the first major maritime corridor in the world that the U.S. cannot control and dominate. So there's a, a lot of, at stake here, both in the military and the geoeconomic uh, aspect. So, uh, okay. so uh, yeah, so I would say that for this reason, a lot of the conflicts are shifting more towards the economic. But as we know, uh, military instruments of power can still be used in economic competition. And, uh, and this is a card the United States can play uh, if, well, using the Norway as a front line in the Arctic. Mm. Um, <clears throat> let us talk a little bit more about the Northern Sea Route. For China especially, it is important because uh, they are producing all the products who are delivered to Europe and the Northern Sea, sea Route will shorten down the transportation uh, time. Uh, for Russia, you said already, it's important because Russia will provide all the infrastructure on this route, uh, but also for Norway and the countries in Scandinavia, maybe Finland and Sweden, uh, it would be a very important and interesting project because all ships who are coming through this route 
will come along the Norwegian coast. So it should be in important or interesting for Norway too or not? Well, it, it, it could be. And there's been uh, several feasibility studies. Uh, uh, however, not all, all the... Uh, no, all the ships will come through Norway. They, uh, Russia also have a uh, Murmansk where they can shift into a bimodal bi format where it's uh, where this uh, car cargo is uh, transitioned to rail, for example. So, uh, but but Norway uh, and and Finland and whatever has a lot to gain from this project, obviously because they will become then key nodes of this uh, northern sea route as a uh, yeah key link in this transportation corridor. Uh, so I think it was the mayor of uh, Kirkenes, a northern town in Norway, who, who stated that they hoped that uh, their town would become the next Singapore. Uh, I think that was the mayor of Singapore. No, sorry, the mayor of Kirkenes. But uh, uh, I think this is a bit uh, overblown. I don't think <laughs> it will become the next Singapore. But it kind of uh, demonstrates how important it can be to be a key node in an international transportation corridor. So I would say there's a lot of opportunities to be found there. Uh, but it's also an area where Norwegian and American interests uh, are are separated because for the United States, it's not ideal to have uh, key allies being tied up in a Chinese-Russian transportation network. So, uh, so this uh, is um, yeah, much like in other parts of the world and in Europe, uh, an area where interests are diverging. Uh, so this is one of the problems of outsourcing a foreign policy to another country with the assumption that the interests are always the same when we see that there is some uh, divergence. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I, from, from the feasibility studies I've read, uh, there's, there, it seems more likely that uh, Finland would take uh, a more prominent role uh, in such a corridor if it goes through Murmansk and then by land cutting into uh, Finland. Uh, that being said, Norway obviously could play uh, a key role in this project. Um, are there any discussions in Norway at all about these possibilities, about the development of this uh, Northern Silk Road? Well, that's part of the the, the, the paradox of these uh, uh, of these sanctions. That is, uh, we, we we joined in on all the sanctions against Russia, uh, which means that the Russia is now. Uh, you know, developing this, will develop this with China instead. And uh, also in the broader geostrategic framework, Russia is now prioritizing its work with China. So, um, uh, so, for, so for this reason, um, we, yeah, we, we, we tend to uh, yeah, exclude ourselves from these possibilities. And then at the same time, once Russia works with China instead, we look towards this big threat of uh, Russian-Chinese cooperation. So it's... Uh, we push. We put ourselves in a very difficult position, and I would also add again that the United States and and, and Norway have uh, not the same interests, but also not the same positions. Uh, if we look at how the United States is uh, is preparing or currently seeking to confront or undermine this uh, uh, this uh, yeah, northern uh, sea route, this Arctic route, as well as Russia's extraction of energy resources, which we could also join in on, uh, it must be added that the United States. Uh, does not actually hasn't actually ratified the U.S. Sorry, the U.N. Convention on the Law of, sea, of the Sea. So the United States therefore does not recognize Russia's but also Canada's Arctic maritime ter uh, territories. So for this reason, they designate the sea to these countries as as international waters. And yes. if it's international waters, they will insist on the freedom of navigation, which means they will sail their ships through and deny uh, yeah, Russia but also then Canada uh, exclusive rights for these waters. Um, now, this is interesting because Norway has ratified the U.S. Convention on the Law of the Sea. However, it seems nonetheless that Norway will then, because of this new frontline position against Russia, will become a key partner uh, with the U.S. Uh, for the U.S. to access what it calls international waters. So there's, there's some lack of uh, consistency. And, uh, um, and this is further being pushed as the United States envisions this role for NATO to take a key role as a security organization in the Arctic, uh, it, it would further, uh, I guess, militarize an area which was previously defined mostly by peaceful cooperation. Uh, so I'm, I, am, uh, I, I, I doubt that Norway will play a significant role in this, which means uh, uh, our losses to some extent as uh, not following how the world is rapidly changing. 
Yes, but this small but very important detail that the US not has signed this UN convention could lead to very dangerous situations in front of the Norwegian coast. Uh, for some weeks ago we saw already that the British Navy ship in the Black Sea was really uh, close to the Crimean coast and the Brits said that uh, these are international waters, uh, Crimea or Russia said these are our waters. So this situation could lead to misunderstandings um, and to really dangerous situations uh, directly along the Norwegian coast or not. Yes, and it, you kind of have to put this into a larger historical context because Russian history has largely been a tale about gaining access to enable to modernize getting access to international shipping lanes. I mean, ever since uh, Peter the Great uh, established St. Petersburg uh, on the Baltic Sea in the early 1700s, uh, Russia was kind of w without any maritime corridors ever since the invasion of the Mongols. So for, for the past 300 years, then it's been a policy by the United Kingdom and then the United States to deny Russia access to uh, waterways. And uh, and this has been a very open policy um, yeah, for now 300 years. And after the Cold War, uh, it's a policy that uh, I would argue have continued. You see NATO has expanded up the Baltic Sea, by including Baltic states. NATO is now working very hard towards making the Baltic, uh, sorry, the Black Sea a uh, NATO lake, which is uh, part of the posturing happening there. And it just makes sense also to push harder into the Arctic, where Russia now looks like it will be the main the main the Arctic uh, power being able to administer and control the key transportation corridor between East Asia and Europe. So, uh, so it, yeah, so there, the, the precedent is there, and it, it it seems very safe to predict that this is an area where the United States, but obviously also Britain, as it seeks, uh, you know, to revive a global role, uh, Russia. Obviously, they're doing the same, not just uh, in the Black Sea or the Arctic, they're also doing the same along the Chinese coast as well. So uh, this uh, effort to control the waterways is, is something that will continue and something that will provoke a lot of tensions, especially at a time now that Russia and China are coming closer together and coordinating their, their, their policies in order to uh, deny the United States this, uh, this hegemonic role, if you want. Okay. All the countries uh, who have areas in the Arctic are uh, connected in the organization of the Arctic Council. There are eight countries, I think it's all the Scandinavian countries, included Denmark because of Greenland, um, it's Iceland, it's Russia, uh, it's of course uh, Canada and the US. Um, the last meeting of the Arctic Council on the level of uh, foreign ministers was in May this year and uh, all the speeches from the ministers are available online on the website of the Arctic Council. I have read some of them and when I read them I get the impression that there are no problems. Everybody wants the same. Uh, an environment, a stable, sustainable area, uh, a peaceful Arctic. So what is this organization about it? What kind of things are discussed in the Arctic Council? Well, the Arctic Council kind of had a low profile for a while because it wasn't really an area of geopolitical competition. As you mentioned, uh, a lot of the focus was uh, yeah, environmental protection, for protecting uh, indigenous people, uh, being a format for cooperation between the different Arctic powers. So. Uh, while other parts of the world were uh, embroiled in a lot of conflicts, uh, the Arctic cooperation kind of uh, st still functioned, uh, simply because there wasn't that many zero-sum interest and competition. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, um, was it about two years ago? I wrote an article in one of the bigger bigger papers in Norway when I made this argument that this is going to change very quickly, that Norway is being cultivated into a front line there, and. Uh, and this was yeah, criticized as well, obviously, as Russian propaganda. But but as we see now over the last two years, there's been this uh, big effort to uh, yeah to to make the Arctic more of an area of competition. And you see this also displayed in the Arctic Council. So I think it was in yeah, in 2019 when you had a U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo 
who, who showed up at the Arctic to, <laughs> at the Arctic Council to make a speech. And uh, again, it was very much, uh, um, yeah, not, not consistent with the usual uh, uh, discourse which is had there, which is this uh, area of absolute uh, gain and, and cooperation for yeah, common good. Instead, he used it as an opportunity to, to you know, explain that, uh, you know, China and Russia are, you know, belligerent powers. They should be confronted, and uh, and again, very much uh, yeah, beating their war drums in this Arctic Council, which uh, has always had this very low profile. Not, uh, mm. not, not really been a venue for uh, geopolitical uh, competition. And the Arctic Council is always led by one of the member countries. Um, the last uh, two years it was Iceland and now this year in May Russia was taking over so Russia will lead the council in the next two years. Uh, do you think there will be much more attention on the Atlantic Council and maybe also in the press much more propaganda against Russia as the leader of this council or uh, what do you think? Uh, there could be. I would be, uh, yeah, be cautious about making uh, predictions on it because, uh, um, like I said, the, traditionally the Arctic Council has tried to stay away from this kind of very confrontational language. Uh, yeah. the, the Pompeo speech uh, of 2019 I referred to, uh, that even took the American NATO allies by surprise. This was, uh, you know, very, it was not place a discussion so it's uh, uh, it, it, it it could uh, the rhetoric could uh, change over the Arctic and uh, it's hard to say if it will happen now during the uh, well, once uh, once now that Russia's leading it but but the overall trend as uh, economic interest keeps growing in the Arctic uh, one would make a fair assumption to uh, to expect uh, more um, more rivalry, but also for the information war to to continue to intensify. Yeah, more propaganda, more accusations, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of what the Arctic Council does, which is this building of trust, and um, yeah, scientific work, uh, environmental work, all of this might uh, suffer uh, if this is the case. Mm. Um, when we talk about the um, uh, northern sea route, of course, Russia and China are the countries of most interest in that. Um, so that will not be maybe a big discussion in the Arctic Council. Um, military questions are not discussed or security questions in the Arctic are not discussed in the, um, in the Arctic Council. Um, so uh, there are not so much topics they can talk about. Maybe this is not so an important uh, organization. No, but it, again, it comes in the context of uh, wider changes in the world. So as mentioned before, Russia and China are now increasingly cooperating in what they refer to as the Greater Eurasian Partnership. Now, part of this uh, part of this project, well, it has many layers. They're looking towards developing anything from uh, strategic industries, new transportation corridors, and uh, financial instruments. But within the trans uh, within the transportation sphere, uh, it, this uh, Arctic corridor falls within a larger project. Uh, and as we've seen over the last years now, the first the United States dismissed a lot of these infrastructure projects, uh, transportation corridors, as being something uh, temporary that would flop. But now that the Chinese are have put trillions of dollars in it to rewire. Uh, the, the transportation infrastructure of the Eurasian continent, uh, we see that the U.S. is stepping up and becoming more and more vocal in its uh, efforts to, to to stop it or slow it down and set up alternatives. So uh, obviously for the Chinese, they've pushed very hard this, uh, this transportation network throughout Eurasia. So some going south through the Middle East, going through Central Asia, going through Russia, connecting itself closer with Europe. The Russians are doing the same now, also east-west, but they're also going north-south from, you know, Russia, Iran, and India, but uh, a key uh, project in this entire trillion dollar effort of uh, rewiring or restructuring Eurasia has been this uh, Arctic corridor. And for Russia, it's very attractive because um, at times it can play second fiddle to the Chinese due to the different economic sizes. But in this area, this is Russian territory, it's Russian waters. Uh, here, it's an it's a opportunity for Russia to, to play at least an equal role. And uh, and 
and it's obviously it's top of the list of areas where the United States can try to confront uh, Russia and China uh, under this uh, claim of uh, you know freedom of navigation into what it calls international waters. So I think as this uh, as this efforts to push back against the Greater Eurasian Partnership, I think there will be probably this will be expressed to a greater extent in the Arctic Council. Uh, but it will also be an area where we see that uh, European and American interests might not coincide that much anymore. So it will be interesting to see if the Europeans will follow the Americans, you know, in confronting projects which the Europeans could actually benefit from. Hmm. Um, so in the end, we are coming to the question of the start again. What can we do in Norway and how we should react um, in cooperation with our biggest neighbor, Russia? And of course, as a NATO ally, um, we are standing a little bit in the middle. And if we don't have an own policy and no own ideas, uh, what we want, then it will be very difficult for Norway um, in this world. So what do you think? What should Norway do? Well, the, the interest of Norway is not to you know, do the biddings of either the United States or Russia. Of course, it's great to have a relationship with both US and Russia, but uh, Norway should not, you know, pursue what's necessarily Russian interest. Uh, instead, the point of departure should be what is in Norway's interest. So where is our security interest? Where is our economic interest? And in terms of security, this, uh, you know, building up the, or converting Norway into this front line against Russia is obviously not in, in our interest. And also economically, uh, this idea of, of a, a, yeah, connections with Russia, but also China, uh, in order to cement our partnerships with uh, America is also not necessarily in our interest. So I think the point of departure should be for Norway to clearly define what are the Norwegian interests. And thereafter, uh, look towards how, based on this, we can cooperate with the Americans, how we can cooperate with the Russians and others. It seems like we're starting at a uh, at the wrong end. We're effectively saying, no, all our interests are tied up with the United States, which means we're now outsourcing a lot of foreign policy. And whenever U.S. and Norwegian interest actually becomes divergent, uh, we will effectively ignore Norwegian interest and just uh, work as a vassal for the United States. And I think this is a uh, yeah not, not, not an ideal position to take for for any country. So again, the point of departure of any discussion should be first defining what are Norway's national interests, and then use this as a foundation for developing a policy instead of going on this you know. Uh, NATO first policy always and I think what we will find if we take such an approach is that Norway's national interest will best be defined by restoring this balance we had before be a good ally to NATO members but also be a good neighbor towards the Russians if we can get our way back into this position I think it would be much better both for the Norwegian security as well as our economic interests as you say we have managed it in the whole Cold War time to be a part between uh, East and West. We have had good relationships to our NATO partners and good relationships um, to Russia. Um, so we have managed it in many years, but uh, but now it looks like that we have no idea how what we want, what we really want, and what it's uh, good for our development in our country. Yes. No. It's. Uh, I think Norway. We we like the idea of being a bridge between the West and uh, Russia. However, we have to be honest what has been occurring over the past, especially the last 30 years, and that's been, we've been developing more and more as a wall, as a, as a front line. And I think this is a, a very unfortunate uh, development, which is not in the Norwegian interests. And uh, so again, if there's a way back to this restoring this balance between a good ally and good neighbor, uh, that was a sound policy, which has, unfortunately has been abandoned. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we could uh, pay a price for this as, uh, as the power in the world keeps shifting. Okay, Glenn, um, thank you. I think we have got an overview of uh, uh, this topic. It is very important and we will see uh, what will happen in the future. Um, so uh, thank you for today and uh, thank you for watching. And please subscribe our channel and we're seeing you soon again with a new video. Thank you, Glenn, and goodbye.